Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Sharice Grace, and I'm the manager of trade marketing and stewardship at the Almond Board of California, and I'm delighted to kick things off today around our disruption dialogue. Sorry about that. Um, and this is a panel discussion about standing out in the increasingly competitive snacking category. Today, you will hear from Bridget Greeny of Two Betty's. You will hear from Anish Benmali from BLD Bar and Joe Taylor from Real Handful. And they will all share their perspectives on key trends and opportunities within the current snacking landscape. During this panel discussion, feel free to submit all of your questions via our Q&A box and note if you submit questions and we're not able to answer them live today, we will get back to you via email. And on another note, I just want you to know that at the Almond Board, we are very happy to be a resource for any questions that you may have around formulating with almonds. And there goes my email again, I apologize. And um, so feel free to reach out to us at foodprofessionals at almonds.com and uh, we can assist you with all almond formulation questions. And now, without further ado, I am so happy to hand it over to Luann Williams. She is the Director of Innovation at Anova Market Insight, and she will get us started. So thank you guys again, and please enjoy this discussion. Okay, thanks for the really nice introduction, Sharice. So um, I think this is super interesting. There's lots of webinars and, and events online, but I think it's always the most interesting when you can talk to um, entrepreneurs and founders. So I'm super happy to do that. And just to provide a little bit of context to our talk today about snacking, um, which by the way, um, a lot of Americans did a lot more of during the pandemic. Um, we're gonna hear more about the types of snacks that you're, that you're launching in, a, in just a minute, but let's just look at, our, at some top 10 trends and some trends around snacking. So this year we are seeing a lot of um, Interest from consumers in sustainability. Um, the number one global concern for consumers around the world this year is um, health of the planet. So shared planet has really just been building on years and years of, of trends around clean label, around transparency, around simplicity of ingredients. And now it all has to make sense and, and consumers really want to make sure that that companies are using the best of resources. Plant-based is a, is a really big topic. Um, almonds are a plant, so we're gonna hear a lot about almonds and sacking today. Um, we also know that, just to sum up these, because I don't wanna go through them all, but consumers are also looking for products that align with their own values. Um, they also wanna have a bigger voice in what's being made. And they also wanna have amplified experiences. We've just come off a period of two years when food was just about the only entertainment that we had. And so there's a lot of adventurous consumers and people are looking for different types of food experiences. So that's also something that we're gonna hear about today. I have a couple more slides, if we could go to the next one. Um, again, I just showed you those, the trends that we have, but just as I want to look now at some of the almond snack categories and how those trends apply to it. So the first one that I mentioned is shared planet. Um, again, there should be an animation behind that to make it disappear. So here we looked at um, products with an ethical claim as a percentage of snack launches versus snack launches with almond ingredients. And what you see is that almonds are being leveraged as a, as a good sustainable ingredient. Um, it goes along really well um, with these sustainability claims. Sharice just mentioned that the Almond Board can be a source of information. They definitely have a lot of information on all kinds of topics around this. So that's a great place to look for this information. But you can see that we see an increase in snack launches that have, um, have an ethical claim and the ones with almonds are outperforming the, the category as a whole. Um, I think we're going to the right. The next one is back to the roots. Consumers are really interested in, um, in local products. I was actually um, a couple of nights ago speaking on another event, which is also about almonds, and somebody talked about what would one of the big trends be in the next year or so. And I said, I think for the, for the almond industry, they should really look at this whole idea of local. 85% of the world's almonds are grown in California. Um, there's all kinds of nice stories around that. And here's just a nice example there. You can see it's even you know called small farms, farms there. But consumers are super interested in understanding where they're ingredients come from, very interested in local products, um, and everything is local to someone somewhere. So how do you make a meaningful story that connects with consumers and aligns with their values? And that's really 
um, what this trend is about. The next one is about upcycling. We know that a lot of consumers, oh, the other way, let's go back. Um, consumers are interested in upcycled ingredients. Again, that goes really well with sustainability, but also consumers see um, that there must be extra benefits in those ingredients that they have been recycled. We have a nice example here around almond pulp um, from the almond milk industry being reused um, in a snack. And then I mentioned this adventurous consumer looking for an amplified experience. And you can see there in the left-hand box there, this is just a great example of how almonds really lend themselves well to different shapes and textures, but also every kind of flavor um, seems to pair up really well with almonds. So if you're making those kind of adventurous products, um, almonds can be a good choice for that. And then we can just sum up on the next slide just some of the key takeaways. I know that's a lot of, a lot of text, but you will have a copy of this. But again, looking at the products that real are these trends that really apply to snacks, we have the shared planet, plant-based, almonds are a snack, plants are, you know, we're seeing a lot of interest in everything from botanicals, nuts, leaves, um, in addition to some of the other formats. We think we're in a, in a position now where we're going to really see plants become the canvas for a whole new kind of innovation, and I think we're going to hear something about that today. I mentioned voice of the consumer. Consumers expect to have a bigger voice. If they like something, don't like something, want to give their ideas, and there's lots of ways for brands to, to capture that. Um, health is definitely on the agenda, and you can imagine it's one of those trends that's been amplified by COVID, but we're seeing a lot of interest um, and more interest in the microbiome. We see this as a big opportunity. Um, so that's, that's the trend there. Back to the roots, I explained amplified experiences. I explained what else can you do to make your product just bring something different. It can also be an experience that aligns with your brand or with your product or a new way to eat or share something. Um, upcycling, upcycling, I think I explained. And at the end of the day, finding products that really align with consumer values is really important. So I think I will stop talking now. It's much more interesting to hear from the founders. So we're going to start out um, with each founder giving us um, a couple of minutes, introduce themselves, and talk um, a little bit about their company and their products. So we're going to start with Joe. Hi. Okay. Thanks, Luann, and thanks um, the rest of the team for the invite today. Delighted to speak with you all. Um, so my name's Joe. I co-founded a business called Real Handful Snacks with my wife, Carly, back in 2016. We are food and drink born and bred working for businesses like Kellogg's and Heinz and uh, Carly worked on the Beyond Meat launch in the UK recently. Um, Real Handful was born out of our passion to help bring healthier snack options to the UK where I think like a lot of other um, a lot of other, uh, economies around the world we kind of uh, we, we kind of default to chocolate and crisps or potato chips as our kind of go-to snacks um, and, and nuts are a category in particular nuts and trail mix are a category where we saw a a really exciting opportunity for growth with the fact that people are becoming more and more educated around health and wellness, um, but also the nutritional benefits inherent in almonds and peanuts and cashews and, and dried fruits and all those other products. Um, our business is uh, predominantly retail led. So we work in the UK with major supermarkets like uh, Asda Walmart, Sainsbury's, uh, Waitrose. So the kind of top five retail partners um, and our, our kind of real Point of difference and what we're trying to build more of a story of within the category is within nut snacking. Um, we have legislation coming in in the UK um, to encourage people to to trade out a potato crisp into categories like nuts that deliver more nutrition. Um, so we're really trying to help retail partners double the size of the nut snacking category in the UK, and we do that by shouting about our credentials. So by by the fact that we we don't roast or fry our products in oil, we air bake all of the nuts within our ranges. Um, we also brought a lot of new flavors into the category, which is traditionally 60% sea salted peanuts is, is kind of the default. We're bringing in flavors like vegan, vegan maple bacon, vegan brandy cream for Christmas, um, sweet and salty categories like popcorn have helped establish some of these new flavors we're bringing in, as well as recyclability, particularly a variety of ingredients like Californian almonds or Argentinian high lake peanuts that have added origin story, um, better flavor, better quality. Um, and naturally functional benefits. Um, and then one of the things we're really excited about at the moment is this year, we're just about to launch with Whole Foods Market in the UK and then rolling out to other retailers, a brand new range called Air Nuts, which is a, a nut snack where we're taking a nut and we're making it 60% lighter by, by crushing it down and then baking and aerating it to give people a, a lighter way to enjoy nut snacks as well. 
Wow, I think that really takes all the trends boxes that I that I just mentioned. Um, you have a lot of nice benefits on there. Can we ask what flavor is the most popular? Well, um, the the default when we talk about nut snacking, as I say, kind of fifty five to sixty percent of that category in the UK is just sea salted. But what we know is that younger consumers, particularly, are really interested in new flavors. So when we're doing testing at the moment, hot chili um, and sweet and salty are two flavors that are testing really, really well. So Blending sweet and savory has done really well for the popcorn category, which has doubled in the UK in the last five years. Um, but then also more challenging flavors like hot chili as well, where we we can kind of add a bit of, of heat and adventure into the mix. Really nice. Okay, so we'll move to our second founder now, um, Anish Vamali. So Anish, do you want to give us an introduction to your to yourself and also to your your company and your products? Hey everyone, I'm Anish Vamali, and I'm the founder of Build Bar. We are a savory protein bar company, and we are taking the idea of a protein bar, and typically when consumers think of it, it's a sweet dessert flavored, and we are kind of transforming it, flip, flipping it on its head, and creating a savory flavor using chip ingredients, chip flavors. And so the idea behind this was that in the mornings and in the nights when you don't really want all the sugar and the sweetness with snacking and you want something that's a little bit more hearty and doesn't give you the the crash in the middle of the day we created flavors that uh, kind of help you to to not do that and so uh we have like a, a line of flavors starting with our country ranch flavor as you can see and then we have a smoky barbecue flavor, a margarita lime flavor, and an everything bagel flavor as well. Really nice. Somebody asked me, what is the best nut flavor to go with beer? I can imagine your bars maybe go well with beer and other kind of soft drinks. What's the most popular flavor right now? So currently our most popular flavor is the everything bagel flavor. Um, not only outside of outside of our bars, I've seen just the everything bagel trend pick up around where I live, especially, and consumers have been really liking the everything bagel flavor a lot. Okay, Bridget, your turn. Tell us about your you and your products, your company. Hi there, Bridget. Um, my co-founder is my mom, Nancy Becker. We're based in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, Two Betty's bakes truly nutritious and delicious snacks, for goodness sake. Um, we are focused on producing, as I mentioned, a truly nutritious snack that is also delicious. So we focus on naturally gluten, grain, dairy-free ingredients, nuts being um, the primary lead there, and on a handful of delicious flavors, not on the savory side. Uh, I think given the, the donut shape, <laughs> it's best communicated in a, in a more sweet uh, flavor. We have chocolate chunk, chocolate chip, sweet almond, maple cinnamon, tons of delicious flavors. Um, they're all baked, um, we manufacture and distribute our own snacks and they're all baked by hand in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and yeah, we, our primary focus is on our D2C channel at this point. Really interesting. Um, do you want to talk about flavors a little bit? What's the most popular flavor of your product? Yeah, our most popular flavor, I'm. It's interesting, like people have like their specific one that they love, um, but it's definitely a chocolate chunk. But during the fall, we have pumpkin spice flavor that, um, you know, people are obsessed with. And then we are in this year in 2020, introducing more seasonal, like limited release launch flavors. Nice. Okay. So we're going to start with our, our discussion now. Um, so Bridget, we'll just continue with you. So can you talk a little bit about the white space that existed in snacking and how you fill that gap? Yeah, so when before we launched, we went and sampled and, uh, you know, surveyed snackers outside of a traditional grocery store in the mid Atlantic region in the US and we found that snackers were going into the grocery store to purchase raw fruits and veggies or the nature Valley Oreo Velveeta type um, snack or breakfast bars and there wasn't really a lot of in between. Um, in, in our opinion, those are not the most nutritious options for a snack. And we really feel like there was a missing gap between like a protein bar, meal replacement bar, and a brownie or a cookie, you know, in that space. Um, and we wanted to create a product that was 
truly delicious and enjoyable to eat that was approachable um, and the nutrition spoke for itself. Um, and we, we find that our consumers, someone who wants to be healthy, knows they should be healthier, but doesn't necessarily know where to begin. Um, and taste is incredibly important in their, in their food choices. So like I think about it, I probably have seen protein donuts before, but it's mm -hmm. usually get, like in the protein section of the grocery store. Is that your consumer or is your consumer the mainstream consumer? Yeah, our consumer is more the mainstream consumer, you know, that we'll find, um, you know, when we survey them in their pantries, like Kirkland brand, not, you know, packaged nuts and granola products, LaCroix seltzers, and, you know, they're shopping at like a stop and shop type grocery store. We're not currently in stop and shop, but um, you know, more that that level um, or that that tier of consumer, um, you know, we, we believe following the consumer and the consumer sort of shapes where you go with the product. Definitely, you know, the high end whole foods, Lululemon wearing consumer, we have that consumer profile in, in our in our audience, but it is the more general snacker who, like I mentioned, you know, might think a nature Valley bar is something nutritious um, as a snack for the day. Sure. Okay, Anish, well, we go to you next and can you talk about the white space that you thought existed and and how you filled it? Yeah, so I, when I came up with this idea, like I mentioned before, there was only a limited amount of flavor options that were on the sweeter side for protein bars. And when I talked with a lot of my friends, I used to work at a farmer's market with this product where I could see live sampling. I found that a lot of people were almost unwilling to try a protein bar and unless I told them that it was savory and that it was something different. Um, consumers were really used to something that is more chalky or sweet flavored. And so when they first try a savory bar, it kind of takes them a second to visualize it in their head, what they're actually eating. And as they go on to the second bite, they kind of realize that, oh, you can have a bar that's less sweet flavored. And um, there's many time options that you can use to eat it. So right when you wake up in the morning or right before you sleep as a late night snack as well. I think and it might've been on the packet. Are they chewy or crunchy? Uh, they are crunchy bars, yes. And Joe, you talked a little bit about some of the um, the things that were driving your launches, but do you want to just maybe fill us in on a few more details? You mentioned regulatory, which I thought was really interesting because few things can drive a trend really fast mm -hmm. or faster than the government. Um, but can you talk a little bit about the white space in, in your category? Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I think it, I, I guess for us, we focus on within the category we're in nut snacking, just the opportunity to help drive more frequency and bring new consumers into that category. So I think there's a real polarization in, in nut snacking in particular, which is a big category where um, people who describe themselves as healthy are the ones that are most educated on the nutritional benefits of, of nut snacks, but they're the people that are most put off and kind of most unlikely to trade into the kind of default execution of that category in retail. So, so you can get your kind of raw nuts and make mixes at home. And there are a lot of people that do that, but to drive real kind of widespread appeal and, and, and adoption. Um, it's that it's the R's and R's of kind of roasted, salted in oil nuts that, that people are presented in within, within grocery. So I think we see that as the opportunities to, to help partner with grocery customers to, to just drive more permissibility by using a baked product by then through innovation, like the air nuts. So I, I, I talked about the air nuts snack, you know, kind of a, a they're like little bites like this, where we're, we're aerating it by presenting nuts in a very different way. Um, because people have been used to seeing them for the same as the same product for the last kind of 70, 80, 100 years with private label and kind of one brand dominating the category and doing things the same same way again and again and again. So, um, you know, I think our proof point is um, potentially this trend bears out in, in the States, but nut butters have, have nearly doubled in size in the UK over the last eight years. So they've grown by 87%. So um, people recognize that a nut butter, which is a nut, you know, almond or peanut or, or cashew kind of blended and, and with very minimal ingredients being added to it is really nutritious and really flexible and can be enjoyed in lots of different ways. We want to try and help retailers do the same thing within the, within the supermarket environment in that nut snacking category. Okay, so you really do have a mainstream um, audience. As Bridget mentioned really the um, maybe a, 
a higher income type of audience, but um, have you seen any shifts through the pandemic? Um, anything different impact on your business? We'll start with you, Joe. So we've seen, um, I guess if I talk about the category and then about our business within within nut snacking and, and snacking in general in the UK, I think like you hinted at at the beginning, uh, a lot of sadly kind of fairly unhealthy kind of comfort food type trends coming through in 2020 as people, um, you know, were stuck at home and, and defaulting to potato chips and products like that sharing at home and, and the kind of impulse where a lot of the healthier and then and, and, and more innovative NPD sits within supermarkets and on the go traditionally, I guess that space was either handed over to something else or people just weren't out with the regular footfall. So I think, I think just by circumstance, we took a step back probably from a health perspective in the UK in 2020. And we saw that in our business. So we were until 2020 an impulse led business and all our distribution was impulse led in grocery and out of home and food service. So we've really had to kind of pivot our product towards a more mainstream customer, like you say, by, by playing into that kind of main category as well as impulse, because we realized as a startup, there's huge risk just doing one of those two things. We need to be able to cater to, to both audiences on that shopping journey, whether they're topping up or whether they're popping in to grab something quicker, more quickly for lunch. Um, what, what happened at the same time in 2020 is probably a little bit of a, a drive down in value as well. So a, a slight move towards private label. We've got a big discounter trend in the UK. So Aldi and little European discounters are driving a lot of competitiveness from a price perspective, but we're definitely seeing as we shift now into 2022, I think consumers are demanding more. We've got big, big trends with the legislation, like you say, but also rejection of single use plastic going on in the UK at the moment. So a lot of retail partners looking to kind of future proof their ranges with um, playing into healthier, better, but also playing into these packaging trends as well um, going forward. For sure. That's definitely something that I hear from our snack customers is like Nutri-Score is a really big topic. How do you do? And the retailers are really pushing that, right? And and we hear a lot about the packaging as well. So Anish, we t we heard about different eating occasions and so on. Can but can you talk a little bit more about your who is your target audience for your products? Yeah, so typically, our target audience, uh, similar to what Bridget said, is a little bit higher income, and on the healthier lifestyle, uh, fit lifestyle type of trends. So we see that a lot of our customers have been in the female audience and they are people who like to work out, um, run, go on hikes, but not like, it's not a bar for big, um, like workout weightlifter type of that kind of category. It's more of the casual fit, um, keeping healthy category. Um, and that's kind of where our demographics are pointed right now. Interesting. And have you seen any shifts or any changes um, during the pandemic? Yeah. So to kind of piggyback off of Joe, I I've noticed in the industry specifically the bar category that um, and I've talked with friends about this as well. But during the pandemic, since people were staying at home a lot, they tried to go or they tended to go away from the grab and grow variety of snacks, which included bars because they weren't on the go, they weren't um, going to the office and traveling with snacks. A lot of people have transferred to remote work. And as 2021 has come around, I've talked with the same group of friends and they've noticed that it's starting to pick back up a little bit more. People are transforming from remote to kind of a hybrid schedule with work and um, that has caused the grab and go variety, uh, category of snacks to pick back up again. Oh, that's really interesting. I have heard that also from customers and also different ships in markets. Um, and, and if they, have they gone from small packs to big packs and things like that? So that's definitely, and that affects packaging choice as well. So that'll be interesting to watch. Um, Bridget, what about you? Um, anything to add about your target market or talk about um, what's happened to you during COVID? I mean, I think everyone was reaching for comfort foods in 2020. So <laughs> even myself, um, I found, you know, the bag of chips or the, you know, not healthy snack and you just needed that. Right. So, um, you know, that that was obviously going on and then it, it would be 
you know, most brands had to focus on that D to C channel. Um, you know, we launched online um, and we kind of got away from focusing on it and 2020 forced us to focus on it. And it's now our, our primary channel um, for growth. And I think that what Joe said, you know, just in terms of trying to train behavior or um, position the product more as a, you know, staple, you know, as a time of day consumption um, versus an impulse. Um, so building routine around breakfast or, you know, as a indulgent treat after a meal, um, really giving purpose to, you know, how and when to consume the product has helped consumers, our, our consumers become not just like a one-off purchase uh, impulse buy, but a repeat customer. Okay, now I wanna talk about ingredients. So I'd like to, so we've heard a lot about your products. I think we kind of understand where they're positioned in the market, but can you talk about how your strategy or your priorities affect your ingredient considerations? So Joe, you will talk about nuts. So why don't we start, start with you? Oh, he's muted. Yeah. Sorry, I was uh, caught myself before I went on for too long there. Um, yeah, a, a great question. So I, I guess we have like three pillars to what we stand for at Real Handful when we're talking to consumers. The first is like great products. So that's about credible nutrition and great quality of ingredients. So um, I talked about it earlier. I think the examples there are, you know, we only use a Californian almond because we we understand that that just carries a huge weight in the consumer's mind of the health connotations, the story, the origin story, the the quality, the kind of family nature of almond farms and 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 the industry that sits behind an ingredient like that. And, and it's similar with the peanut side to our range where we use a, an Argentinian peanut um, purely because they, they grow a higher lake variant that's got this kind of nutritional advantage to it that we can talk to consumers about. So so really starting with ingredients as a as a core cool part of that pillar. The next part of our pillar is like the experience of having a real handful snack, which is it should always be kind of fun and delicious. So that means you know ingredients that kind of a, a stay whole rather than broken that, that you're kind of experiencing product that kind of looks great as well as tastes great, but also tastes absolutely delicious so um, i think on the slide previously we had um and you asked about flavor as well one of the things that was really big for us last year was playing around within nut snacking on seasonal flavors so we did a, a christmas range for the first time with vegan brandy cream almonds and um, cocoa caramel um, we're doing gingerbread latte and flavors like that this year consumers kind of love that flavor experience and it works really really well with an, an ingredient like an almond but that really works very, very nicely in combination with other flavors as a kind of seasoning. Um, and, and the final one is for us, it's really important that um, healthier snacking is accessible for people from a price perspective. So we focus very much on using almonds, cashews, peanuts, the nuts that are, you know, uh, price accessible for people and, and, and recognized. And, and it, you know, it makes it hard to work with ingredients like macadamias as an example, where there's just there's such a premium to the product, the ingredient that um, we're not going to kind of deliver what we want to do within the category, bringing people in if we, if we alienate ourselves from, from a price perspective. So we always try and balance everything we're doing around this, you know, delivering on value as well for, for the consumer. You know, I should maybe tell everybody you, we, none of us talked before this. So it's just, um, your, your products really align very well with the trends I've talked about today. <laughs> so it's really interesting to hear about the flavors that you're, that you're working on. Anish, over to you. Can you talk a little bit about your ingredient choices based on your strategy or your priorities? Yeah, so we are obviously going the more natural route, just like the other founders. And so we had that in mind when we were creating the bars. We wanted to stay away from sugar alcohols. We wanted to stay away from uh, artificial flavors and just things that ingredients that consumers can't read on a label and they have difficulty pronouncing what the name is because it's more chemically sounding. Um, and so that's one aspect of it. Another aspect that we try to look for in our suppliers is people who upcycle their, their ingredients when they use it. So for example, we use a pea protein disc and we work with someone who, the way it works is they separate the pea protein powder from the peas and they also get like a slurry that is made of water and it used to go to waste and kind of just be put back into the ground in some way. 
And now they're taking that wastewater and upcycling it and using it for animal feeds and um, they're using it to um, grow crops and other things as well. And so those two things are both a priority for us. And then also another trend that we see is that we wanted to create something that was vegan. And so before our products had um, dairy in it and we wanted to transform our line to make it all vegan. That way it's not only healthier for consumers, but it's available to anyone who wants to eat it as well. So you really catch everybody. It's interesting that you mentioned the importance of clean label to your brand because we, I got a few questions about that because we, we stopped talking about it in our trends and I had said for several years, it's not a trend anymore. It really is becoming the rules, right? That consumers are looking for this, continue to look for those, those clean label products. It's still really important. Um, okay, Bridget, over to you. Tell us about your ingredient choices. Yeah, so, I mean, our ingredient choices have flown when we, before we launched and where the recipe came from was just myself as a consumer fed up with the options that were not available to me in the grocery store. And I went into my kitchen and grabbed nuts, you know, and almonds being in my kitchen was um, a primary ingredient. Um, and it fits our nutrition, um, you know, mission in terms of being naturally gluten, grain and dairy free. It's an incredibly versatile um, ingredient. We use it both, um, you know, in a chop form and in a, in a ground, you know, flour form in our product. It adds texture and nutrition. Um, and from there, in terms of our other ingredient choices, um, is just those that support, obviously, you know, the nutrition component and, and are tasty. Um, and almonds are also, as Joe mentioned, more, you know, cost effective than like a macadamia nut. We do have pumpkin seeds, um, but those, you know, the cost difference is, is quite um, astonishing, so. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit about um, the future now. So um, the question that I have written down is where are you focusing your energy or your growth? And where do you see your brand in five to 10 years? So Joe, I know you talked a little bit about some of your new things that are coming out, but can you talk about other things that you're doing and where you are spending I think energy is a great way to describe it. Where are you spending your energy and where do you, what do you think is gonna happen next with your, your brand? Yeah, I think, I mean, look, I, th I think if I, I guess I'll answer the question, which is answering kind of the t where do we wanna be in 10 years time? Cause I guess that's a conversation we're trying to have now. So um, two things going on that one, when we're trying to talk to customers that we're working with, we are specifically talking about having a bold vision of helping them double nut snacking in the UK market over the next 10 years. And, and I think that could apply to, you know, um, other markets as well, to be honest, when we're looking at the kind of opportunity to increase the growth of that category. So, so we want to be a partner in, in a category where there's a single brand. And I think it's a very similar situation in the States where there's kind of one or two brands that really kind of dominate a category like nut snacking. We want to be kind of the agitator, the kind of challenger that cuts through. And I, th I think if I, if I could, wrap it up in a simple thing i think if you ask a consumer in the uk in 10 years time are nuts a healthy snack i kind of want people to unequivocally say yes and us to be a, been part of that journey to, to help educate and consume that because i think i think nuts is a category that that gets mixed reception from consumers at the moment because of the way it's been executed historically um so i think we want to help I, I think kind bar a really good proof point of a brand that you know have helped drive a lot of education and in, in our market, they're driving a lot of education around the, the health benefits of almonds and other ingredients. And, but I still think there's quite a long way to go and still quite an exciting kind of opportunity, just continue to improve that, that education of the nutritional benefits of nuts and, and grow the, you know, the, the different occasions, I guess, like, I mean, like the team are talking, you know, two Bessies as well, you know, just different ways to kind of enjoy nuts as an ingredient in whether they're in a raw form or in a finished form and as part of a finished product. I think it's really interesting that you mentioned like this, this perception of, um, of the nutrition around or well, the way nuts have been presented. And I think if you think about, we've changed our opinions about eggs, we, you know, back and forth butter. Um, and I think we've been talking about certainly in our office this week about dairy fats and, um, and there's a lot of change in perception around dairy fats as well. So it'll be interesting to see if, there's a discussion if it's really about mostly salt or is it also around the fats and nuts as well and, and some of the positive benefits of that. So I think that's a really good point because there's definitely a lot of 
consumer re-education going on around a lot of topics um, in this regard. Okay, Anish, over to you. Where are you spending your energy and um, or your growth, and and where do you see your brand in five to ten years? So in five to ten years, I really want to have Buildbar be a household name, and we are working towards building our company to become that. Um, I want to have the bar market is currently seen as, like I said, the sweet dessert flavors, and sugar is the is the ingredient that people are kind of trending away from right now. Um, typically, sugars are um, just not good for the body. It's the, the industry kind of picks something, an ingredient or a nutritional aspect of foods every 10 or 20 years to kind of pinpoint an attack. Um, so a decade or two decades ago, it was fat and then um, a few decades before that, it was the trend of um, claiming that carbs are unhealthy and it kind of revolves and transforms every few years. And right now we think that sugars are the one that's kind of causing the problems in our in our diets because our society kind of accepts that sugars are okay. And another thing that we are doing is our, with our direct consumer route, we kind of want to help and um, child hunger. And so we're working towards that by donating uh, every box that's purchased from our website. We're going to be donating a bar towards um, helping child hunger. So we pick a, a new foundation every month and we donate a the portion of our bars that is equated to the box a month towards that foundation. So social alignment with social causes is really important for your brand as well. Yeah. Okay, Bridget, over to you. Tell us about your time, your energy, your growth, and your plans for the future. You know, we remain opportunistic about where we're going with our brand. Um, as I mentioned, we're continuing to focus on our D2C channel. We pivoted that from a retail focus right when the pandemic hit. Um, so retail will become in the next five years, you know, a bigger part of our focus um, for growth. But I think it's interesting, um, you know, when we think about nuts as our primary ingredient um, and, you know, where we fit into the category and space of nuts, like, we want to be part of the conversation of nuts as a more functional ingredient, um, a more nutritious ingredient. Um, I think I can't speak for global nut, um, you know, what you're talking about, Joe, but I think here in the US, like we know nuts are healthy for us. We don't necessarily reach for them because they're not as tasty or delicious as that bag of chips um, or fill in the blank. Um, so flipping the narrative or flipping the script, so to speak, and saying, well, nuts, you don't need to just eat a, you know, a handful of raw almonds, similar to what you're doing. You can use it in more creative ways, um, turn it into a healthy mini donut as we've done, and you might not even know that it is um, you know, primarily almonds. I think that's really interesting. I mentioned that the first trend or the second trend that plant-based a canvas for innovation. Mm -hmm. And that's a great example of that nut is now a little donut. Yeah, um, no, it is. I mean, it's an incredible nuts in general in general are incredible. They can, you know, become whatever flavor and spices you add to them and they're incredibly malleable in different forms. They can have texture if they're chopped or um, yeah, there's a limitless opportunity in terms of new product innovation using nuts. It's a very interesting ingredient from that point of view, mm -hmm. like you said, because you can make it liquid, you can make it a and, butter. and to add, it is more nutritious than, you know, wheat flour, um, you know, there's more fiber um, and more nutrients naturally found in nuts. And almonds will make wrinkles, but will help you with your wrinkles. I saw some <laughs> research on that in December. That, so that's our big focus five almonds. years from now. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Okay, I have one more question, then we're going to see if there's um, a few questions that are coming from the audience today. But Brands, what is your brand's biggest challenge? And Bridget, you're talking, so just continue and yeah. share a little bit about that. Um, I think, I mean, across the board, we're kind of hearing it, right? Like, there's a big education component here, um, and I think that's that's part of our challenge as well. Um, explain a small brand, small marketing budget, explaining why our product is more nutritious um, for you. Uh, it tastes. I, I 
I'm obviously biased, but I it is as tasty. Our chocolate chunk flavor is as tasty as a brownie, um, but it is certainly not a brownie. So how do you communicate that, um, you know, effectively so that your consumer learns, learns something and also begins to trust you? Yeah, very interesting. Okay, Anish, what about you? Your, your um, brand's biggest business challenge? I think right now with the pandemic, the biggest challenge is supply chain issues. So I constantly have suppliers reaching out to me about um, delays or possible price increases. And I, there's kind of not really, it's hard to see if there's an end in sight. Um, we obviously have backup suppliers for a lot of our ingredients and we try to get it for all of our ingredients, but um, just the shipping delays and the logistics with, um, especially in America, the trucking now is becoming a big issue with truck drivers. Um, everything has kind of cascaded and um, into just everything being slowed down. And the result of that is the suppliers trying to increase prices. And then on my end of it, when I get increased prices, I have to then decide whether if I want to increase the price or if I should just maintain our price and kind of um, see if the trend of uh, of shipping logistics kind of dies down um, and supply chain issues dies down. You are not alone. Mm -hmm. I hear that every day too. All kinds of supply issues. So that that is, that is going to be a challenge. Okay, Joe, let's finish off with you with the last question. Brand's biggest business challenge. Yeah, I, I, I mean. I'll, I'll cheat and have to because the first one is is what Bridget said, which is education and education is so expensive and so time consuming. And I think, you know, uh, what we found through COVID was social media became even more expensive as a way to kind of engage and bring consumers into D2, D2C. So um, we're really going a little bit old school and, and doing more trade events and shows and getting in front of consumers and driving trial packs and, and, and other ways to kind of get product in people's hands and start the conversation. And, and I think that leads into the second challenge you know, that is expensive. And then there are big multinational companies that have um, done things the same way and are geared up to continue doing them the same way uh, that, that are major players within the category. So it's ensuring that we can kind of be scrappy enough to find our voice and find the partnership of the retailers um, in, in, in like the fact that we do have some very, very big competitors, but, you know, everyone's got competitive, so it, it doesn't feel like a very unique challenge to throw out there, but as a smaller company, you're kind of more conscious than ever, that you've, you've got to get that foothold until you, um, you've got a bit of a, a protection and an insulation against the bigger competitors in the market. So I guess that's why we've, we've developed something like air nuts, which has got some patent protection to it to complement what we're doing within our core nuts range. So that, um, and, and it sounds like everyone else here on the panel is, you know, developing something that, that's got that uniqueness to it, that's got that point of difference to it, um, to ensure that you're not just trying to compete on a commodity basis. Yep, very smart. I have to say, I'm going to totally steal a word from you. I'm so sick of hearing the word disruptor and you use the word agitator. <laughs> I think that's, um, it's a, it's a great word. So I will, I will try to create. It's, it? it's like a mosquito. <laughs> kind of, uh, yeah. 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 So, yeah, I think that's very realistic as well, because it's really hard, as you said, to totally knock out a, a big player, but you can certainly agitate the category. Um, okay, we just have a few minutes for questions and we have a, a couple that came in. Um, so one question for sure, uh, you must have um, made your products seem very appealing through our conversation today. So somebody asked, are all these products available throughout the USA? So do you wanna just talk, just everybody answer a little bit. We'll start with Bridget. I see you all on the screen. So I see Bridget, Anish and Joe. Um, yeah. How, how do you get your products? Ours are, they're available at twobetties.com, um, direct to you. We'll ship to you in the U.S. Very good. Anish? Ours are currently not available. We're sold out, but we will be back um, towards mid-March or beginning of April. But we see we sell direct to consumer and on Amazon as well. All right, and Joe? Uh, well, very, very excitingly, we... Uh... I got a, a FedEx last week, which is our, our certificate of registration of our trademark in North America. So um, watch this space. We've been doing a a, a big piece of research on, on the States because because we don't approach it lightly because it's a big market. Um, 
uh, the reception to what we're up to has been been good. So we're looking at potentially trialing through D to C in the next kind of six to 12 months. Um, and, and, and we're also starting to have conversations with Whole Foods. Now we're trading with them in the UK about how that might platform up as a conversation as well. So, so we shall see. Really nice. Okay, this is a, a great question. So health and dietary trends or fads are constantly evolving with some more lasting than others. So how do you stay relevant to the present while keeping the future in mind? So Joe, would you like to start off with that? Well, I, I suppose I kind of go back to what's lovely about the nut snacking category, which is nuts are about as old school as snacking gets really for kind of humans and humanity. So um, I, I do think that nuts and, and you know, almonds um, in particular, because of the different nutritional profile are, are a product that kind of pervades all of, of these categories. Um, so so I would, I'd say that I'd, li I'd like to think that we can kind of keep up with, with all these categories, you know, plant, but, you know, we're plant-based, we're, you know, we're, we're good on fiber, we're good on protein, we're functional. I just think nuts are a brilliant all-rounder that can, that is really adaptable as trends continue to evolve. Um, I think the biggest thing we're relevant, we're, we're conscious of is kind of allergies, because that's quite a big barrier in the UK and in certain channels is, is, is allergy considerations. But I think even science is starting to advance within allergies where where there might be new options coming on the table in the next kind of five to 10 years that might support addressing that slightly as well. Interesting. Bridget, what about you? How do you stay relevant? Yeah, I mean, what's more relevant than having a better nutrition facts panel than the competitor? So, I mean, I think that's sort of how we look at it. If we are, have more protein, more fiber, less carbs, less sodium and less sugar, then it doesn't really matter if we're gluten-free, grain-free, dairy-free, soy-free, we're healthier. Um, so that's, that's how we look at that. What about you? I think that um, to stay relevant with the present trends, kind of piggybacking off of what uh, but both Joe and Bridget said, all of our products are honestly just very natural. And so it kind of eliminates the need to um, ride, ride out a fad or a dietary trend. Um, my par product in particular is gluten-free, vegan, um, plant-based. And so all of these things, things combined with the natural um, aspect of all of our products, it kind of weeds out the fads and is just a solid snack um, to use. Yeah, I'll add one thing to that, which is nuts allow for a more simple ingredient list also, which I think consumers, I mean, you mentioned it, Anish, like if you can't read and understand the ingredients that are in the product that you're eating, that might, that would for me be an, a turnoff. And I think we're seeing that, I mean, we've been seeing that with consumers. So having a simple, clean ingredient list. Um, just one more question. This is maybe more business focused, but how do you decide which online marketplaces to join or to sell your products? Is this kind of, is it formulaic now? Are there certain ones you have to do if you're a startup brand? Uh, Joe just mentioned also going a bit old school, also thinking about different ways to do it. But can all of you just talk a little bit about how you make those decisions as a, as a startup? Bridget, we can start with you. Yeah, so we're only available at subetis.com right now. We're in conversations with some other D2C grocery uh, channels, not Amazon. Um, you know, I think for small brands, you need to be mind well, in my opinion, you need to be mindful about who those partner channels are. Um, and a brand in a channel like Amazon, you know, it's not as simple as just putting your product up there. How are you going to drive brand awareness? You know, what are your terms and what does that negotiation process with them look like? Um, and we were pretty small, we're growing <laughs> and I think we'd be eaten alive on a, you know, on a channel like that. If we can drive direct to our, our website at this point, we can know who that customer is, um, have that email, be able to communicate them all the things that are good about two Eddies and what we're doing. So, um, yeah, I mean, everyone has different opinions, right? Like, uh, we get told probably every day to do one thing and do the other thing differently. Um, you've got to be true to who you are and kind of follow your gut on where you're going. What about you, Anish? So we kind of just let the business um, take its own path um, with joining whichever online marketplace we choose. 
And so we kind of tried out different aspects of Amazon direct to consumer, um, going into physically into grocery stores. And we try to really pinpoint which one is working the best for us and then try to really dig at that and go towards that. So previously Amazon was working the best for us. And so we really tried to hit that hard and, um, it helps because you get more of an organic reach as you focus onto one of the marketplaces more. Um, and it, it kind of creates this, um, this trend on that marketplace that kind of grows in, into momentum for you. So you mentioned the prices of social media advertising. I heard that from someone else and they said during December, it was just bonkers. So do you want to maybe just uh, finish this off and tell us about how you choose your your retail or online channels? Yeah, I guess for us, like the UK is a significantly smaller market. So, so we try and avoid it getting too fragmented. So um, we focused on Amazon and, and we present our products in a different format. So we sell in, in kind of kilogram quantities on Amazon. So we have a, a slightly different proposition to our normal retail um, offering. Um, and then we we work with a couple of the online grocers in the space, which a lot of people are jumping on is this kind of uh, is, it, is it rapid delivery kind of rapid grocery service, the kind of 20 minute drop, um, go puff and the likes in the UK. That's kind of a space that a f quite a few startup brands are trying to actively engage with because no one quite knows where that channel is going, but there's a huge amount of money being thrown at it at the moment as well. So I guess that strategically is one channel where we're willing to take a little bit of fragmentation in terms of complexity and volumes, because potentially it's an area that that can drive incrementality within snacking. Is that difficult? You mentioned the formats. I think that's really interesting. Like, I guess you do have to think about different formats and get really heavy if you had a bicycle where I live with, you know, kilo bags of nuts on there. <laughs> but is that something you have to think and adapt all the time, like different yeah. retail packaging or? I don't know. We, we weren't expecting it. We, when we, when we launched, um, the, the savory ranges, um, we started offering a 500 gram by two kind of one kilogram quantity on Amazon. And, and it just naturally is 80% of our sales. Now, I think it, it offers the best value and it's a, it's a more loyal consumer, I guess, that's buying through Amazon. They know what they want. And if you can give the convenience of the delivery channel, um, then it just allows it. And we, we do subscribe and save as well. Like I assume you probably have it in the States as well. So people are actively then subscribing to that on a regular basis. So it become, it's becoming a bit more of a staple through Amazon, but, um, you know, we've still got work to do to kind of scale that proposition, but for us, not having that read across of formats, um, first of all, cause Amazon penalizes you, if it can see your product sold on online groceries and even on your own website, it will actively kind of penalize you if you're not price competitive with Amazon. So it, it allows us just to be in a, a bit more control of our destiny. If we can keep the format separate on a, on a platform like that. Okay, we have a question that came in that I absolutely love because I think, well, we know it's also very on trend to be connected to your roots, where your ingredients come from. So this is from an almond grower and, and they say, what is it that separates one grower from the next? Are there any trends that you mentioned that growers can be conscious of or implement to help us be ahead of the curve in regards to customer need? I think there's nothing better than looking for every opportunity where you can connect the farmer to the consumer. Farmers markets did a great job of that. So what can we do in packaged food? So who would like to, to tackle that? Any advice to farmers? I can go for it. Sure. I think creating a, just a relationship with um, whoever you're supplying to is really important. Um, I like to, uh, during the pandemic, obviously I could only speak to my suppliers through the phone, um, sometimes through video chat, but when I got to meet a few of them, um, at a conference in person, it really just makes all the difference. Um, and then when you meet them in person, their ability to explain, um, how they grow the almonds, um, what their farm looks like, what they're doing to, um, reduce the amount of water that's needed to grow an almond, um, specifically because almonds take a lot of water to grow. Um, all those things kind of combine and it, it just that in-person interaction with a, with a grower helps a lot. I think that's, I think our, that we, I would love to see more farmers at industry shows. I think yeah. it would be hugely insightful for a lot of people and, a, and an important part of the education as well.
Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I think it would be interesting as a grower to have more resources to the end purchaser um, on what that farm, what your farm is doing, you know, to, to focus on some of those sustainability efforts. And as you mentioned water, people forget sometimes all trees take a lot of water. So people never subtract out the amount that a tree takes to grow. You know, and so once you take that out, it might change the water um, yeah. <laughs> equation. So it'd be nice to hear farmers talk about that. Um, okay, we're just about out of time. I'm just going to give you all a compliment. There is one one note here that says um, the education component is certainly a heavy lift, and the work that we need to do making is making healthy snacking attractive. So I appreciate your journey and your insight. Thank you. So I think that's a good note to, to end it on. I have to say I'm full of inspiration. I've been trying to jot down notes while everybody's talking and so on. I have lots of things to think about myself as we, we do market research for, for lots of people and we're always looking to see what consumers um, want to eat and so on. So, um, so thank you so much um, for participating so openly today. I wish you all tons of success. I'm gonna follow you and see what you do. Um, and as Sharice mentioned, there's a, a small survey. So if everyone who participated today would um, would fill that, fill that in, it'll certainly have an impact on future events. So thanks to thanks to all of you, um, and and good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Luann. Thank you, Luann. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. yeah. Bye.